Hey, thanks a lot, Kuldeep. Uh, uh, great. Uh, my name is Nitish Goyal. I'm a principal engineer at AWS Open Search Service. Uh, I'm here to present. Uh, sorry for the bad. I have a bad uh, throat today. <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so today I'm going to present about what is uh, how do we kind of migrate from a self-managed Elasticsearch to an Amazon Open Search Service. What are the best practices? What are the different ways to essentially migrate from one to another? So quickly about the agenda, uh, we will talk about why to migrate, uh, what is the roadmap to manage, uh, what are the migration options or the different patterns you have, and we'll do a quick recap, and then I'll invite one of our customers, Dream11, how they successfully migrate from self-managed uh, ES7.x to all the way to 2.3. Open search 2.3. So why to migrate? Uh, so uh, as you can, uh, there are a couple of benefits, and I won't go on all of them. But uh, some of the key one is uh, what we are seeing is, and when we are talking to a lot of our customers, what we found out is when you actually eventually migrate to Amazon Open Search Service, you reduce the overall cost of ownership of managing this search cluster or your log analytic cluster. So the time and effort essentially actually goes, reduces over time. It may actually feel like, hey, may, maybe it is not the right thing. Uh, it essentially takes longer uh, to essentially migrate. I may actually lose some control, but that's not the case. Eventually, you will actually find out uh, there's an inflection point where you find out, hey, you actually re reduce the cost of ownership of this system. You don't have to kind of deploy the whole team to actually manage that self-managed cluster. Rather, you can just manage this purely through Amazon Open Search Service or a fully managed solution. Other features, including like automated backups, uh, which essentially is critical for, for high durability and for like uh, data dur durability scenarios, uh, security patches, uh, scaling, and other cost optimized features. I want to talk about some of the cost optimized features because those are very pretty interesting. Uh, some of the things like ultra warm, data tearing, cold storage, as well as now we're talking about zero ETL. So some of these features like a purely which you can get out of the box with managed service. Uh, essentially, the other, uh, if I talk about availability for, for customers like, for example, Blinkit and like customers who want uh, their search experience to be powered through Amazon Open Search Service, we have uh, products like uh, multi AZ standby, which essentially gives you 4.9 availability something which other cloud providers do not provide. Or like within even open search, we had to do a lot of surgery to how we can actually manage a separate stand, stand by AZ to ensure that we are able to provide a 4.9 availability. So <coughs> what does a uh, roadmap to manage looks like? Uh, you will always, like, when, when we think about migration or data migration is one of the toughest thing in, the, uh, in, in computer science. Uh, because essentially, you have to kind of copy the data all the way to the, to the new system. And it may feel like, like, hey, this is like very frustrating. But what it really means, what it really is, is essentially going through a plan. And essentially, there are like six steps there uh, for this plan, which is you start with assessment and planning this. You start with the POC. You start understanding, hey, does this really fit for my use case or not? And then you essentially deploy a new uh, open source cluster and start migrating some of your data. And once you start migrating your data, you essentially have a parallel cluster. Then you start doing more of like tuning, and essentially at one point of time where you find that, hey, this is exactly giving me the same set of performance, I essentially do a cutover. So we'll go one by one. Uh, let's talk about assessment and plan. So you talk about uh, different use cases. Hey, is it, uh, is it uh, my, my use case is single or multi-tenant? Is it a text, is a search-based solution or a log analytics? What type of version of open uh, of Elasticsearch I am right currently? Do I need a re-indexing? Do do I because uh, essentially I'll talk about in some time uh, there is an index compatibility uh, across uh, different major versions. Uh, what are the current challenges of my system? Am I looking for like search latency improvement, or I'm looking for ingestion improvement, or is that something else? Like I'm looking for like let's say custom plugins, or I'm looking for let's say FGAC or SAML based authentication. So it's a variety of things. And you need to kind of like go over uh, assessment and essentially kind of come back to uh, we'll talk about Dream 11. They had something like painless scripts. And do, we, do I need something similar here as well? So, so you do all that uh, assessment, and then you start with the POC. And uh, you understand, hey, what, what, my, what my existing cluster uh, or my existing use case is, am I able to essentially get the same set of uh, functional requirements sorted out with my new cluster or not? 
And from then, you go to the deploy and migrate. And I'll talk about some of the migration patterns we have of how you can essentially successfully migrate. So one of them is restore from snapshot. Uh, if you have an open uh, Elasticsearch uh, 7.x, for example, you can easily migrate to 1.x or 2.x, and similarly 6.8 to uh, OpenSearch 1.x. Uh, so you cannot put a new version snapshot in the older version cluster. Uh, that's what, like, essentially, the, all the versions are backward compatible, not forward compatible. So you need to ensure that your, the, your source version and your target version, there's an index compatibility. Uh, so one, one important thing I want to talk about is because 7.x and 1.x, essentially 1.x was purely a renaming or, uh, from, or a fork from, from Elasticsearch 7.10 to 1.x, customers on 7.x can directly move to 2.x as well because there is no, essentially they do not need to do a re-indexing here uh, because there is no change in the, in the index metadata or in the, essentially the mappings. The second uh, migration pattern is building directly from source. Uh, this is where you're essentially kind of building a new cluster altogether. You have your source, you have your data, uh, let's say stored in S3 or like uh, another table, uh, and you're able to kind of use different tools like open search ingestion service, uh, data prepper, log stash, where you can essentially kind of take your data and all the way put it into, into open search. Uh, the third one is building from existing uh, Elasticsearch uh, cluster. Let's say you have a self-managed cluster and you want to kind of move directly to this open search cluster. So things like you can do remote re-indexing. Uh, remote re-indexing, you have a re-index API in open search, uh, which can essentially helps you to, to migrate that. But there are like few things, few gotchas around it. For example, if you, have a, if you do not have a source field, you really cannot uh, use this option. Uh, and one of the downside uh, of this option, what we have seen is, uh, you really need to scale up your existing cluster as well, and you may not need want to. For example, this cluster already is serving uh, your customers, and you may not want to scale your cluster or touch that cluster while you're while you're uh, serving your customers. So, <clears throat> so we do. Uh, we have seen customers, variety of customers, actually going all the way to uh, directly going to the migration better too, which is uh, reading directly from the source. And the last one is uh, repointing the ingestion pipeline. Uh, this is where, uh, specifically for customers who are using log analytics and uh, have more of like a data tailing solution where they do want to only store, let's say, last seven days of data or last uh, two weeks of da uh, log data into open search, uh, into, their, into their search cluster. And that's where they would like to essentially say that, hey, okay, let me purge all the data which I anyways were not requiring, so let me just get all the fresh data into, into uh, this new cluster. Uh, so uh, with that, we'll talk about uh, the last thing, which is uh, tuning and cutover. Uh, essentially, once you did a deployment, you did a data migration, now is the time where you actually start testing your stuff to ensure that, hey, this new cluster serves uh, the purposes what you were looking for. And in this, uh, the first thing what you do is uh, you need to make sure if you're moving from, let's say, a very old version of, let's say, 5.x of Elasticsearch all the way to, to OpenSearch 1.x, you may actually start seeing that there is index incompatibility uh, as well as there can be a client incompatibility as well. For example, if you're using a, uh, a new security uh, authentication mechanism, let's say FGAC, uh, you need to ensure that your clients actually get updated first. So you actually work, work on building a, a beta application, work on uh, ensuring that all your functional tests, all the use cases, if it is aggregation or if it is search or it is log analytics, your functional use cases are being, uh, are, are, uh, are being supported in this new cluster. Once that is done, you talk about performance benchmarks. You look at, uh, we, we talked about, and we looked at some of those uh, performance request tracing and other frameworks. You can make use of even open search benchmarks as well to understand uh, is, is my existing application able to support the same set of latency or maybe better? What is my driver for motivation goes back to that. So you do all these performance benchmarks, you tune and size the cluster, and then essentially you finally do a cutover uh, to your new system. Uh, to new open search service. And like we have seen customers who are essentially retiring that the old cluster in a week or two, uh, depending, upon, uh, depending upon the cluster. So uh, just a quick recap. Uh, essentially, it's not a big bang. It's a journey. You start with planning. You validate with the POC. You deploy. You, did, you do a migration. And then you essentially do a cutover and go live.
With that, I'll uh, invite Mehul Batra, who is a, a lead SD on data platform on uh, Dream 11, who has done a successful migration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. Hey, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Mehul Batra, uh, current data lead at Dream 11. Uh, so, how how all of are you uh, sports fan? Who all of are you sport fans? That's pretty exciting. So it's a good thing. And as sports and data go hand in hand, so be ready. I'll be taking you on an exciting journey and how we migrated from Elasticsearch to OpenSearch. So uh, today's agenda would be more around like a bit about what is Dream11, uh, what our medieval platform looked like, and what all pain points uh, we had, and the challenges that we faced during our journey, as uh, Nitish mentioned and how we jotted down the plan for the POC to pilot to production, and what all future plans that we had today with the open search. So uh, a bit to talk about Dream11. So Dream11 is world's largest fantasy sports platform, and we vouch for our scale. So to give you some context about our scale, so we have a currently strong user base of 220 plus million users, and we currently cater to a concurrency of 15 million, so a one thing about our concurrency is there's a sudden peak of the traffic. So the currency concurrency could go as high as like from 0 million to 15 million within 10 minutes of span. And we do ingest billions of event. Along that, we have a lot of ML-driven personalization and scaling mechanisms. We have a petabyte scale of open lake house, as we said, sports and data go hand in hand. So we are data driven in a lot of aspects. And last but not the least, anything that we see repetitive in-house, we try to develop a self-serve platform on top of it so that we could increase the developer productivity for that. So to give you some context, like what we wanted to achieve out of our uh, Elasticsearch cluster. So anything or anything, everything we wanted to get in real time to make uh, decision making for our internal users. Those users were uh, surrounded uh, with like data scientists, decision science, data analytics, marketing team, product team, or uh, even the backend developers. So to give some context, let's say, let's talk about metrics. So if, if somebody wants to know the metrics in real time, let's say what is the uh, contest join rate that is going on when we have launched a com contest, or what is the team creation rate that is going on currently, or the team edits or maybe we want to know the aggregated gateway payment statuses, uh, what gateway is performing what way so that we can route uh, accordingly, or maybe we want to detect the anomaly or unusual traffic pattern in our systems, or lastly, uh, if we want to set up some alerts based on some threshold, so let's say we do release mega contest, so if the mega contest got filled more than 90%, so we want to know the internal users that it has uh, scaled up to 90%, uh, we do want to take some action, so we'll shoot an alert via Slack. So uh, that is how our medieval platform looked like. Uh, so give you a brief walkthrough. So we have our transactional data, which is sitting in a MySQL database. Uh, it flows to the Kafka topics. And on top of Kafka topics, we have a Kafka Connect cluster, which uh, takes uh, data to Elasticsearch one-to-one. -one. We, we did a lot of, a little bit of massaging on the data using SMTs, but not too much. And uh, on top of that, Elasticsearch used to do a lot of uh, heavy aggregations uh, for us to provide the Kibana dashboards or the monitoring alerting. Or using painless scripts, we do provide uh, the aggregations on the notebooks for the decision scientists or the data scientists. So few of the things that we did on our Elasticsearch was uh, the version that on Elasticsearch we were sitting on didn't have any in-house capabilities to provide the aliases or maybe come up with the index life cycle, which includes the rollover policy or the uh, delete life cycle policy or the scaling, the scaling also we used to do manually outside. Uh, we didn't have any option to scale up and down using the cluster properties. So after a point, uh, we realized that this is not going to be uh, scalable enough for a long term. So the pain points that we were facing at that time was the one of the major pain points was uh, maintainability. So the elastic version that we were sitting on was like 7.8. And that was quite old. It had a lot of outdated dependency. And one fine day, I still remember, uh, we were about to scale our data nodes of the cluster. And we got to know uh, the open distro has closed the distribution of Elasticsearch cluster. And we couldn't scale. So for a hack, we, what we did was we created the AMI for the existing data nodes. And we replicated those data nodes. So that was the time when we thought, like, this is not going to last enough. 
And as I uh, shown in the previous diagram, we had a lot of internal dependency, which rotated around running the separate scripts like lifecycle policy, alias, or putting alerts on the freshness of the indexes. And the stability, as we deal with a lot of scale, uh, by sitting on the older version, we were seeing a lot of performance bottlenecks. And even after scaling, we were not getting the optimal performance that we were expecting. So at that time, it was the high time, and we decided, like, the time has come to start listing our, out our needs and start looking out for the alternatives. So uh, for the functional needs, what we thought of, like the system should be multi-tenant, because for each internal user, we kind of provide them a proper tenant-based system. Like data science will have their own tenant. The decision science will have their own tenant. And they will have their own set of dashboards and own set of indexes to play along with. Uh, on, uh, secondly was uh, support for the advanced uh, time series aggregations uh, for uh, data analysis. And uh, lastly, uh, schema free. So as we also move our events data to our uh, open search or elastic search cluster, we wanted a data store which could handle any dynamic schema so that we don't have to give a predefined schema. And on top of that, uh, there were some of the as operational aspects also that we already had and we wanted to go forward with. So uh, we uh, at Dream11, we highly rely on uh, some of the uh, external uh, uh, plugins that we use on top of OpenSearch. Uh, one of the, a few of them were like ElastAlert. We used to use ElastAlert for YAML-based alerting. And to produce data on our Elasticsearch and OpenSearch clusters, we used to depend on the Kafka Connect. And alongside, we also started using Flink. So we wanted a data store which could support all of these so that we don't have to look out for other options on that, those aspects also. And uh, the lifecycle rollover or the alias policy, they should come inbuilt in the cluster rather than we again maintaining a separate skit, which could again become a headache for the extra maintenance. And uh, the data store should come with the APIs where we could also maintain the health of the, uh, we could keep a look on the cluster of the health so that if cluster is going through a trouble, we could monitor and we could take action promptly. And uh, uh, lastly, uh, we were looking for a data store which could be highly distributed and which have a high availability where we could uh, have an automatic failover or data replication among the different nodes. So after all of this, uh, we uh, looked out for the options and open source was the one which uh, checkboxed all the boxes and we thought of let's move with the open search. So post that, uh, we jotted down the plan so our plan rotated around was uh, challenges, performance, and outlays. So for that, uh, we started a POC. So our POC started with the primary, secondary setup. So we kind of, uh, we kind of targeted a small cohort of internal users. And we went to them and we asked them, like, what all indexes and what all needs do you have? And we started replication, replicated those needs in a separate cluster. And our primary cluster, which was dependent on Elasticsearch, was running as it is in parallel. And post that, uh, we got the feedback from the users uh, for that uh, small cohort. And f after that, we came up with the th three propositions. Like, uh, there are going to be three things that we have to deal with during our migration phase. The challenges, uh, the performance gains that we're looking out for, and the outlays. So it was the right time, because not every time you get a chance to replace the entire data store. So we wanted to get the best out of our performance and the outlay for and to tweak the compute at its maximum level. So uh, the migration challenges uh, that we came up with, like uh, nobody in our team has the prior experience with the open search. Yeah, it does come uh, very close to Elasticsearch, but it has its own set of community. It has its own term of guide, uh, guidelines, rules, and documents. And on top of that, uh, we were dealing with a huge amount of data. and. Uh, one of the things with the huge amount of data that comes to us is uh, we have a highly concurrent reads and writes parallelly at the same time. So when the writes are happening at the same time, the reads are also happening. So have, we need to find it something where we could do both things at the same time. And we needed to do a performance testing, not of the data store, but also the producers that are going to produce on that data stores and the readers that are going to read from that data store. And uh, lastly, uh, as I said, uh, we were heavily dependent on uh, Flink, Kafka Connect. So I still remember when we started doing our, uh, this transition, the open search was quite new, around like one and a half or two years back. And uh, the, uh, I joined this Slack community, and it was quite small, like 200, 300. And I'm, I feel very good to say that now it's like almost 3,000 strong. So uh, 
there was not much support of the connectors for Fling and Kafka, so we started working with the community. We did what we could to push the things forward, and uh, we did uh, bits of builds up and to come up with the support for Kafka Connect and Flink in-house. And then uh, we wanted to have the zero impact on the current users, while all of this we are doing in our secondary cluster. So as I said, like that was the right time to get the performance gain. So I'll talk about some of the properties that we touched to get our uh, average search latency during the peak hours under 200 milliseconds. So some of the basic properties that we all talked about, like shard count should be directly proportional to node counts, or like shard, one shard takes almost like 1.5 v-core CPU, so sh you should be considerate while selecting your CPU and the number of shards that you are placing on that node or CPU. And your shard size should be somewhere between like 10 to 50 GB. Anything less or anything above that could hamper your performance. Then uh, some of the things were around like refresh interval. So not every index that we are ingesting needs to be real time. So we can, again, uh, we try to play around with different, different indexes and with the different, different refresh interval. Then uh, the life cycle, not every index is supposed to stay in the data store for a month or a week or a day. So we kind of came with the life cycle policies for the different indexes and the swappiness. So we played with the swappiness property, and we disabled it to get the best performance out of our cluster. And as we said before, like uh, we were looking for a multi-tenant uh, support. And uh, so if uh, you have multi-tenants and those tenants are relying on the same kind of data set, so you can consolidate those indexes to increase your efficiency. And then uh, as our use case was mostly analytical, so we knew uh, the schema of our indexes, so we pivoted from dynamic schema to static schema. So the static schema gives uh, open search a breathing space so that open search doesn't have to go and decide on every document, like what kind of schema do I have to align it with. And one of the things that we noticed was if you are going ahead with dynamic schema, if you have a number or a string, what uh, most of the time open source does is was it will take the highest possible. So if you have a numeric number which could fit on an int, it will open source will automatically sometimes take long, which was of no use. And in case of float and double, the same thing was happening. So we kind of uh, hard coded or we kind of gave the static template where the numbers which were only int, we went with the int, the number which were float, we went with the float, and which helped us to decrease our memory footprint and uh, for the analytical use cases, uh, for the string, uh, for the string uh, data type, we uh, went with the keyword. So basically, how keyword helps is here is keyword coins the entire string as a single term. So you can do more analytical things on top of that, and you don't need uh, the tokenizer to apply on that. So if you go with the text, you are just uh, using the tokenizer uh, to tokenize your string keyword, which will of new use, and you won't be able to do aggregations on top of that. So keyword here helps us to gain, again, more performance boost for our aggregated uh, use cases. And as we have uh, read and write heavy use cases on the both ends, so to cater our read heavy use cases, what we did was we increased the number of replicas for our indexes. So let's say if uh, you, you have only, uh, if, if you don't have any replica and your primary node is serving the request and it takes a lot of pressure, so it might uh, not be able to cope up with and your uh, read latency could go up. So what we did, when we increased the number of replicas, what started happening is if the primary node is under a lot of load, the secondary will come into the play and it will start uh, serving the request behind the scenes. And on top of that, uh, we try to play with the caches. So open source does provide different type of caching, like shard level caching or index level caching. So the shard level caching could be applied with the help of the kind of dashboards or the aggregations that you are doing on your uh, open source setup. So most of the dashboards which are being opened by the uh, different users in a similar use cases. So you don't you no, need not to always hit the request to the cluster it can be served via cache also and that will actually help you to speed up your reads and for the write heavy uh, use cases 
we did increase the shard counts to an optimal level where we can get a high throughput for our writes. And we tinkered around the uh, queue sizes, like uh, the thread pool queues, because we saw when we were trying to write our thread pool for the queue were going above and beyond, and it was not able to keep up. So we tried to increase the queue. And we were able to increase the write throughput that we were expecting for. And uh, we also tinkered with the buffer size. So buffer size do help you to keep up with your indexing performance. And it helped us to uh, gain the, uh, gauge the write heavy workloads. So <clears throat> on the outlay side, uh, it was, again, a very good opportunity to tweak down your computes. And so what we did was we tried the mix of both horizontal and vertical scaling. As we all know, not one size fits them all. So it did help us to overcome the hot nodes, improved our nodes and shard counts ratio, and to get the best out of every single machine. And while all of doing this, some of the signals that we looked for was like the thread pool queues and the JVM memory pressure. That helped us a lot. And on top of that, with the help of uh, AWS Open Search team, uh, we moved our data nodes uh, from normal SSD block disk to NMV-based SSD block disk, uh, which are like uh, specially designed disks for faster transfer speeds. And it helped us to uh, boil down our average CPU by 35 to 40%. And we did uh, saw a lower latency. And uh, as uh, for each and every uh, hour for the demands, we started scaling up and down our cluster. Uh, which also helped us to boil down our, uh, uh, tweak our compute expenses. So after we uh, saw like the open search was uh, fitting uh, for all of our use cases, so that was the uh, last uh, point for us to move the entire load from the elastic search uh, to open search. So some of the things that we did was we imported the saved objects from our uh, Elasticsearch cluster and exported to OpenSearch cluster. Then the data migration, and Nitish said, uh, our data migration stands at the uh, scenario two, where we had the source in hand, and we just plugged and played our sources to the OpenSearch parallelly alongside with uh, Elasticsearch. Uh, and we switched the stacks. So the current users, which were relying on the Elasticsearch, we moved them to the OpenSearch. And we kept both the cluster alive for a week. And we took the feedback. And the feedback was quite seamless. And that was the time when we realized that the time has come to sunset our old stack. And uh, so this is our current platform looks like. So as I said, uh, we have now events as well as transactional data flowing to our Kafka topics. So for uh, directly one-to-one -one, uh, data transfer, we still use Kafka Connect. But for like stateful computation or uh, more heavy aggregations, we have an in-house streaming platform that we call Streamverse, which is built on top of Flink. So that did the. Uh, aggregation on the fly, and we keep appending our data to open search. And then open search, uh, again, playing a pivotal role. It does a lot of aggregations, and it powers the dashboards, uh, the insights for the notebooks using painless scripts, and the threshold alerting and monitoring. And one of the uh, things that I wanted to highlight was, uh, with the help of AWS uh, open search uh, scaling, uh, we kind of came up with the framework, uh, which is ML-driven. So uh, the ML model gives us some metrics. and. On, based on that metrics, we decide the bucket size of our cluster, and then we call the AWS APIs to scale our cluster uh, based on the demand of the R, and it helps us to maintain the uh, performance. So uh, this is the holistic view of our uh, changes that happened uh, from moving from Elastic to OpenSearch. So uh, one of the things that I would like to highlight was the, our peak, uh, peak average latency used to go around like uh, 1,000 milliseconds during the peak hours when the match is going to about to start. And uh, the CPU used to uh, linger around 90%. Now both of the things, the average latency had uh, fallen down to under 200 milliseconds, due, even during the peak hours when we have a very high scale of both reads and writes. And the average CPU for us has now fallen down to 40%, uh, which is quite significant. And uh, to talk about a bit, bit of the future plan, so there's an exciting term that is going on. Everybody knows Gen AI. So we are also doing a lot of POCs around Gen AI. And uh, so we are thinking to incorporate uh, vector uh, open search as a vector store for our Gen AI use cases. And uh, we are also looking for uh, Trino has an open search uh, connector. So we, are, uh, we heavily use Trino as a compute layer for analytical purposes. So we are thinking to 
integrate uh, Trino connector on top of OpenSearch to give a SQL-like interface for the users. And lastly, we are again we used to use Elastalert uh, on the Elasticsearch for the YAML-based alerting. So Elastalert do have a support for OpenSearch also. So we are thinking to integrate that as well for the uh, YAML-based alerting on top of uh, OpenSearch as well. And uh, thank you. And a bit about me. Uh, I have twin passions. I love crafting coffee and uh, playing tennis. And when I'm not at work, you'll discover me having a cold brew or maybe rallying in a tennis court. And I'm quite bullish about the Apache iceberg and view it as a representing a paradigm shifting development in the data world. So please feel free to reach out to me on uh, the, my official email ID and you can also add me on the GitHub and LinkedIn. So thank you. Mm -hmm.